Hello, everyone, and welcome to TechSpark 2020, a very special edition, entirely online this year, the 11th edition. My name is Madan, and on behalf of all of us at Your Story, I want to welcome all our speakers today and all of you out there in the audience. Our session today is called Convergence of Financial Services and FinTech, what that future would look like. As you all know, India's financial ecosystem has been spreading and growing rapidly in the past decade or so. It's gone from FinTech 1.0 with largely payment kind of channels to FinTech 2.0 with data analytics and IoT to FinTech 3.0 with AI, ML, AR, VR, and who knows what FinTech 4.0 is going to be. So to look at some of these trends, emerging opportunities, and transformations, we have put together a very distinguished panel of industry leaders. So let's begin with Saurabh Tiwari. He is the CTO at Policy Bazaar. Hello, Saurabh. He is an ardent technologist with experience in both the tech and business sides of things. Before Policy Bazaar, he had stints at IBM GEP Worldwide, and he also founded another company called Zfin. Welcome, Saurabh. Joining us also is Raju Shetty. Hello, Raju. He is the head of engineering at Razor Pay. He served in various engineering positions for close to two decades now. Before that, he also worked with Yahoo, Flipkart, and Infosys. Welcome aboard, Raju. Next up, we have Mayank Kachwala, who is the co-founder and co-chief -oper operating officer at India Lens. Uh, Mayank Kachwala is a Forbes India 30 under 30 entrepreneur. Congratulations. He has over seven years of global experience in this industry. He was earlier at Capital One before co-founding India Lens. Then he also now invite Bharat Pay's CTO to join us. He is Vijay Agarwal, more than 30 years of experience in the internet industry. Before this, he worked with other companies such as Epipo, Grofers, and Hike, among others. Welcome aboard, Vijay. And finally, we have Subik Sharma, Director for the APAC region, MongoDB for India and ASEAN on this panel. He is an industry veteran with more than 23 years of experience building businesses and revenue streams across sectors, including open source software, cloud services, IT infrastructure. Before this, he led the global SMB and India sales divisions for NaviSite, which was a leading cloud applications, infrastructure, and hosting company. So we're going to do this. I'm going to do a, a round of questions. First, I'll begin with one question specifically for each one of you, and then we'll take audience questions for the entire panel. So let's first begin with Saurabh of Policy Bazaar. Saurabh, let me ask you, where do you think this insure tech space is going to evolve over the next couple of years? It was almost non-existent maybe five, 10 years ago. Where is it going now? And where do you think, what do you think the insure tech companies today of India need to do? to create global products. Saurabh, over to you. Thanks, Madan, and happy to be here. Uh, I think when you talk about InsurTech, I just want to basically talk about insurance as an industry in India first. And most of you have been the customers have been buying insurance traditionally. And if you look at the way that insurance was being delivered and distributed in the industry was largely through agency channels, banker insurance channel, and the channel which was pretty much uh, neglected was digital channel, direct to consumer channel. If you look at around the entire uh, taxonomy of distribution in the India, but what people have not been able to do for years, this COVID has done. The pandemic has kind of pushed the entire system to go for digital. Policy Bazaar has been digital right from the beginning, but for the entire ecosystem, this has been a boon. And this is the biggest emerging trend that we are seeing right now direct to consumer channels, digital channels are going to take uh, a very speedy recovery and movement in the industry. And that's the first thing which we see. And certain things which were already in the pipeline, which we were all, all focusing, but uh, nothing has to do, it, it has nothing to do with the pandemic, was uh, customer centricity in insurance. I mean, there are many insure tech firms in, the, in, in, in the India and abroad who are actually very good in building enterprise software. But very few are who can actually build a very scalable enterprise software, which is end consumer focus. So that is an area which is again going to have a lot of focus because direct to consumer channel will pick up and eventually the consumer related tech will take the precedence over anything else. And the third trend which I see possibly is going to happen is uh, micro insurance products where customers can pay a small amount because the payment ecosystem is evolving beautifully right now. What we have seen in last uh, few years, the entire ecosystem has given ability for consumers to pay in small trenches and the ability to buy a product which suits for a certain smaller period is available right now and people are finding it convenient to buy. So these products will start coming in. And the fourth trend which I add is uh, 
I'm just adding because this looks like a one that is going to be most uh, prominent as we move forward is uh, one product doesn't fit for all. And if you look at insurance product where what people buy, they buy one single product, which is not actually a right fit for them. So what we believe with the data and digital emergence, which is happening in the industry, the company should be able to build products which are very custom and personalized to the consumers. So that's where we will focus as we move forward. In terms of the companies focusing on the uh, building product from a global aspect, I had also tried doing that from an insure tech perspective. I would say one of the areas which will emerge is uh, insure tech needs to provide better softwares for claim processing. A software as a service model has to become available so that companies can buy a cheaper solution for their needs. And customer centricity, of course, that is required. So what I believe as the system as the system is evolving, a SaaS product, which is covering all the three dimensions of the insurance uh, business, which is marketing, sales, and service, and handling all these together in one bundled solution, and which does have ability to configure for the various needs and organization would be the best solution. But I have not seen something coming up yet. So that's a desire. Let's see how things shape up from here. Over to you, Madan. Thanks so much, Saurabh. Among the many trends that you pointed out, I think the audience would be very interested in one of them, especially micro insurance. People now know about micro payments, but thanks for identifying micro insurance among many of the other trends. Let's now turn to Raju from Razorpay. Raju, we've seen a lot of movement in B2C fintech. A lot of the news is about B2C fintech, but another very important niche is B2B space. Can you share with us what's happening with B2B space for fintech, especially for small businesses, and how they can benefit from innovation in this space? Raju? Hey, sure. Hey. Thanks, Madan, and thanks for a great introduction. So uh, I'll give you a couple of points in my uh, perspective. In, in, in India, especially, I mean, Indian businesses uh, and need a one-stop end-to-end solution. I mean, unfortunately, we are still not a DIY market, a do-it-yourself market. Actually, we are closer to the FM market, which is do-it-for-me market. <laughs> so, uh, so a full-stack financial uh, solution that is, in, in fact, a need of the hour. Right? Within payments, Indian businesses are looking to solve problems which are greatly unsolved, whether it is cross-border related one, fraud insurance related one, right? And a whole lot of other things that continue to be broken and or untouched as of today. You know, the traditional financial or payment ecosystem doesn't have solutions yet. On, on I mean, if you look at the overall uh, payments evolution, I think there's a good or a great deal of progress that has happened in the B2C space. I think B2B space uh, by and large is still untouched. There is, uh, there's not significant um, end-to-end um, AR or API, I mean, account receivables, account payable solutions, um, you know, are, are still not yet incorporated. I think things will evolve uh, as we speak. There are quite a few players who are trying to um, try trying to solve this particular problem statement. Um, also, some of the you know small merchants uh, would want to actually remove the burden of you know, the compliance burden, whether it is PCI related stuff or data security. I mean, you know, when uh, when Krishna Commission of sorts get uh, you know uh, more or less uh, you know made as a policy and becomes uh, you know general general guideline that everyone have to have to follow. I think these these burdens uh, could be taken out uh, from the system by a provider uh, per se. Beyond these, um, I think, you know, one very important aspect which Saurav has actually bought in, right? Um, as we go beyond, as India goes beyond 100 to 150 million users, the purchasing power parity dips significantly below, uh, you know, uh, below the average per capita of, per capita of GDP, right? Um, India continues to be a large market, but 80% of the market is untapped and not well served with tra- traditional par- products, right? So in that context, affordability becomes a big concern. And I think the whole philosophy of, uh, you know, small ticket insurance or uh, small ticket loans or small duration of loans, right? Uh, you know, properly, uh, even off late, these things are being termed as sachet products, right? Uh, there are, there, there is whole set of innovation that is needed in, 
you know, making these uh, platforms to accommodate to these Sache products and then being able to serve to new business models, right? Um, I think there is a great deal of innovation that needs to happen still in this particular space. Um, we are still scratching the surface and unlike other developed countries in the world, um, I mean, this is extremely contextual for Indian, um, Indian ecosystem. Um, I mean, these are, these are one way of solving um, our financial uh, challenges or financial inclusion challenges per se, right? Um, and last but not the least, um, I think, you know, as we uh, move forward, you know, how, uh, how some of the uh, things like, you know, vernacular and voice driven experiences have to be taken care of so that it becomes a lot more simpler for businesses to solve their end consumers problems. Right? End of the day, uh, when we are actually providing services to our merchants, they are leveraging those services to solve the end consumers problems in a way. At a high level, I see, you know, these are the uh, big things that could possibly happen in the in the coming quarters to years, uh, as we see. Thanks, Raju. Thanks for reminding us all that there are so many untested, unopened markets in India. Let's turn now to Mayank from India Lens. Mayank, what's your take on the credit space in India? How is this being affected by the COVID-19 crisis? What's going to happen after this whole pandemic right. is over? Any insights that you can share with us, Mayank? Sure. So pre-COVID, right, I think what we were seeing on the credit side was a lot of rapid growth, uh, uh, especially when we're looking at sort of financial inclusion, right? Players like us, and there are a lot of fintechs that were expanding the scope of lending in this country. What happened with COVID, I think there is positives and negatives both. You know, the, the, the big negative is obviously that, you know, everything stopped. And one of the bigger challenges that we're going through is there is a lot of job loss, right? And there are a lot of people who sort of migrated back and the, the, uh, the losses, the impending losses from some of those are actually to be seen, right? And we've started seeing uh, results of some large banks and uh, large lenders. And some of them have started to show signs of weakness and losses coming in. That is a bit worrying from that perspective. What that has done is sort of put a spanner in the works in terms of the growth that we were seeing uh, on the lending side. But uh, on the flip side, right, what has dramatically changed and which was not true of lending at all, right, was complete end-to-end -end digital. So because of the regulation that exists in this country or existed in this country for the longest time, right, uh, fulfillment of loans, uh, all credit products had to happen, uh, you know, in, uh, in the presence of the customer and it had to be done physically. And there was very little digital origination happening across the country. The big change that we are seeing now is, I think, both on the customer side and also on the lender, right, the large bank side, we are seeing adoption, digital adoption at a rapid pace, right, from having done maybe less than 10, 20% of our loans uh, uh, originated digitally. Now we are seeing more than 80, 90% of our loans originating di digitally, right, because both sides are super keen. One, the customer doesn't want to uh, interact with any human being, right? Uh, especially because of the social distancing norms. But also the fact that, you know, lenders are waking up to this and the regulation has also supported us uh, in a big way, right? To be able to do this. So I think big changes happening, right? Especially uh, on the digital side of things and big positives coming out for fintechs in the future. I think the, uh, the other angle here uh, to this entire thing, right? is the fact that there is a lot of work, much like what happened with the UPI, right? There was There is a lot of work happening at an ecosystem level on the lending side. And when I'm talking about ecosystem le level, I'm talking about uh, the account aggregator framework and the Oaken framework, right? So there is a lot of work going on there. And I think that when it sort of comes into effect, and I think most likely that's another year, two years from now, that, you know, we start to see the power of what maybe UPI has done on payments, right? We start to see the power of that on uh, digital lending. But there's some, uh, you know, game-changing stuff happening on that front, right? Because not only will we be able to, uh, you know, use the data available at different places in a very, very structured manner to be able to underwrite. And I think finally, uh, underwriting boils down to, you know, your ability to use data, consume data, and being able to underwrite some of those customers that are on the margin, right? Which you would have otherwise declined. So I think a lot of good work is going on. And I think as we see, uh, you know, us coming out of this crisis, uh, the COVID crisis, I think we're going to start seeing a much bigger shift towards digital, especially from the large banks, which are the biggest originators in this country, right? The public sector banks and even, you know, some of the large private sector banks, but also a large 
uh, you know, sort of move towards the OKINs and the account aggregator frameworks, which will eventually help solve the problem of actual financial inclusion, right? Because otherwise, we sort of solve for this problem in, you know, in a sort of piecemeal way. And then finally, some crisis hits, right? And we've had a liquidity crisis in the past and other crises before that. So I think, you know, this possibly solves the problem for the longer term. It will take its own time, right? And I think my estimate is maybe another couple of years when it start, when you start to see the results of it. So I think that's what, you know, we are seeing a trend towards, a larger trend towards these frameworks coming and solving for the larger financial inclusion problem. Thanks, Amayan, for bringing up the very important issue now of ecosystems. And that's a very good segment, uh, segment to bring in our next speaker now, uh, Raju. Thank you. Uh, so to Vijay, uh, Vijay from Bharat Pay. Uh, Vijay, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in the regulation space? Obviously, in the past few months, the government has taken lots of very active strides in this space. So what do you think regulation should be in the future? How can it be more relaxed? How can it be more uh, amenable to the fintech industry? Vijay? Sure, that's a great question. In fact, so regulation, in my view, uh, plays an extremely important role in nurturing and, and growing uh, any industry. I mean, not just fintech, any industry for that matter. And uh, when we talk about fintech, government has done some very, very good things, like whether we talk about UPI, whether we talk about Aadhaar, whether we talk about uh, opening the Jandan accounts and like uh, furthering the agenda of financial inclusion, the government has done some very, very good things. And uh, like there are, there's a lot more to be done and I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, there are things being done. So there are good, good things that we are hearing uh, like from, from the government, from other regulatory agencies. So a lot of good things are happening here. And uh, broadly speaking, I would say that uh, one of the most important roles uh, played by any regulatory agency uh, is in creating a healthy competition amongst the existing players and allowing uh, an easier entry for the new players that want to come in and start contributing and start creating value. Uh, so on that front, uh, like the broad uh, objective of uh, creating interoperability goes a long way. Like as we've seen with UPI, like it is a fully interoperable system. The, the recipient of money can be having an account in any bank and uh, like somebody who's making the payment, that person can have uh, an account in an entirely different bank and yet they can seamlessly uh, do a transaction. So that's a great example of interoperability. Uh, like we've seen how, how that has played out in the telecom industry once mobile number portability was introduced, how that revolutionized uh, the telecom industry. It created a lot of healthy competition amongst the players. Similarly, we are seeing in banking and uh, like the government can do a lot more things. We're hearing a few things about uh, like a more interoperability coming on the deposit side of things. Uh, so that will be a great thing. And, and like uh, generally speaking, like opening up uh, the industry, making it easy for new players to enter. Uh, like bringing in standards uh, so that like uh, different different players and different entities can talk to each other and service the customer in a seamless manner. That's that's a great thing in general. So that's one thing uh, we, would, we would want. I mean, the government is doing a lot of things and we want to see uh, India as a country uh, doing more and more things on that front. So that's part one. Uh, the other part I would say is uh, not so much to do with more regulation or less regulation as such. I mean, we can always have a debate on like how much regulation is the right regulation. But what I personally feel is that uh, making it easy to comply with regulation is, is a great way to, to like make it easy for everyone and make it more valuable for everyone in, in the ecosystem. I'll, I'll give you an example. So, for example, when we talk about KYC, it's not that businesses do not want to do KYC. I mean, they also see a lot of value in doing KYC. But if it is it involves a lot of paperwork, it involves a lot of offline ground force, then that becomes a huge cost. And that, that is the cost that businesses alone have to absorb. Right? So that's where, that's where it, it starts becoming a bit problematic. But if we, if we are able to digitize a lot of those things, we're able to reduce the costs there, the government creates uh, enabling infrastructure, that goes a long way in, in uh, like opening up the industry for more and more compliance uh, with the with the regulations and that is better for everyone it is better for uh, all the players in the ecosystem it is better for government it is better for consumers as well so like if i were to quote aadhaar as an example that, that goes a long way in making kyc much easier than it was before aadhaar and similarly if we talk about things like for example pan card uh, if you have to verify a pan card there, there is very little value in actually capturing a photo of the pan card as such but we really need to identify what we need to ensure is 
like the person uh, who is quoting that pan card number whether he is the person actually is is uh, the right possessor of the pan card whether the data details that person has shared are actually correct as per the government records or not so those things can be done digitally and those things are now opening up and more and more services uh, are coming up uh, for verification uh, in a digital format and that goes a long way in making it easy for everyone uh, to comply with the regulations and follow the regulations and that i believe uh, is a very very good way to move forward for for our industry as such thanks vijay one of the many good points you brought up just now was when two industries come together different issues arise so in this case banking and telecom coming together raises lots of very interesting issues in fact let's turn to subik now subik uh, one very important issue in this whole industry now is trust trust for the consumer trust for the business and security plays a very big role in that so subik from mongo db can you share with us some of your perspectives now on how security is very important cyber security plays an important role in this sector subik yeah so thank you for the question and i couldn't agree more on the importance of cyber security especially in the fintech space right uh, we all know about the report from the official cyber crime report from cyber security ventures which actually states by 2021 the cost to the world for cyber crime would be about 6 trillion dollars annually right so it is a big problem now why is it a problem so if you consider uh, the uh, the penetration of internet of mobile also the need for fintech companies to use uh, the public cloud services for agility and scale uh, and the billions of devices that are connected together you can as it is see that the surface area of attack for cyber attack has dramatically increased right and and it's getting more and more sophisticated so we didn't hear about ransomware in the past this year we are hearing a lot about those kind of things right and then for fintech companies it is uh, on one hand it's about detecting and preventing the cyber fraud on the other hand is ensuring that you're not disrupting the service for a genuine customer because you if you pivot one way or the other it can get problematic a bit right uh, so in the past people have looked at things like firewalls and encryption and these are core technologies but they're good for detection uh, for the most sophisticated kind of cyber attacks that we are seeing today possibly uh, not so well suited so what we are observing is a lot of fintech companies and organizations in general are gravitating towards a data approach of cyber security and what does that data approach uh, cyber security really mean is you're trying to collate all the different data points from either internal systems users and uh, end points and also from external systems like credit score, uh, scores etc and you're putting all of this voluminous different type of data in a single repository for visibility across the enterprise not only that you have to process it in real time and you have to serve the threat models up to the cyber security applications in millisecond latency and then if you want to go even deeper you need to add the, you need to kind of serve it with behavioral analytics platforms or machine learning platforms to get really deeper inside not just to uh detect the cyber fraud but actually to prevent it from happening because you know if the money is gone there's little value in knowing okay how did it go there's more value in preventing it from happening right now in order to be able to do this you have to really rethink the underlying data management technologies that uh, you're adopting so the data management technology on one hand has to have the core enterprise capabilities around authentication authorization you know not just a username password but all integrations with identity access management systems third party systems also encryption so you need that not just in flight but and at rest but also in motion uh, but apart from those core capabilities it that platform also has to be able to assimilate all this voluminous data it has to be able to natively process it in near real time and be able to integrate well with ai ml kind of uh, you know uh, systems to be able to drive that inside and this is where we are really helping the aric platform uh, which is a 
real-time machine learning fraud detection system built by Feature Space, which is a pioneer in behavioral analytics, uh, you know, just leverages MongoDB exactly for that. And what they really do is they create these behavior profiles. So what they're looking for is anomalies in the behavior. So, uh, so not only are they detecting the fraud, but actually preventing that, right? So those are some of the things that we are observing. And other examples could be the McAfee GTI or Global Threat Intelligence, where again, it's all this data-driven approach to cybersecurity. And that's increasingly what we're seeing. Thanks, Suvik. One of the magic words you mentioned was real-time. And real-time is very critical when it comes to data capabilities. So I think we have time to take a couple of questions from the audience. Thanks to everyone in the audience who's joining in once again and uh, sending us your questions. So my question to all of you guys is, um, uh, what, is, what are some of the data frontiers you're looking at? What are some data capabilities you're looking to build up? What are some data capabilities that are emerging in terms of innovation? What's on your radar and what are you building right now? Let's go to Saurabh from Policy Bazaar. Can you share with us some of your data insights in this stage? Yeah, I think I agree with Sovik. It's uh, pretty much the need of the hour, especially when post-pandemic or during the pandemic time, most of our people have been working from home. Suddenly, the fraudulent activities have gone a little higher. And anomaly detection has become one of the most important case to prevent any fraud. See, once the fraud happened, then it's a loss that you have already incurred. So that's an area where we are in kind of basically in investing and kind of constantly working. We are a big fan of MongoDB, by the way, just to let you know. know. And we use it quite, quite rigorously right from 2013-14. And the other areas where we see that there is our larger part of the business is around voice because we have a huge contact center where we connect back with our customers over the voice. And we were the pioneer group in giving insurance services over phone to our consumers. When we are, have larger part of our data lying in voice, we are investing a lot on the voice analytics. So we have, we have pretty much in-house team which converts, transcribes the entire voice calls into a text. And then we figure out a lot of useful information, which helps us in doing the better service to the customer. It's like understanding the intent of the customer, figuring out the sentiment of the customer, fig figuring out fraud and pick picking up anomalies during the calls. These are the areas where we are largely investing and will continue to invest as we move forward. And there are many other areas like uh, uh, doing the car inspection through video, automation where you, whenever you capture a video, our system is able to figure out where you have a dent, where you have a scratch on the car and whether the this is genuine claim process or it's a fraudulent activity. So there are many places where we have been able to put the AI and machine learning around data in use. And we are a big fan of uh, data and MongoDB. Let me just close it on this, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Saurabh, for those very interesting use case scenarios you painted for us. Let's now turn to Raju from Razorpay. Raju, what's the future of data or what's the data of the future for you? Raju? Hmm. Um, I think uh, both show again. Uh, Saurabh had actually shared some of the use cases around fraud and uh, risk uh, related use cases. Uh, I'll give you a couple of insights in terms of what we leverage uh, data at Razorpay, right? Um, you know, one typical use case uh, is around the personalization aspect. Um, how do we how do we help the merchants in terms of uh, maximizing or minimizing their cart cart abandonment rate? Right. Uh, you know, what are the right instruments that you actually surface uh, to the user when they are actually in the checkout um, checkout place? You know, what is the right payment method or even the the bank what they generally use? Is there a way that we can actually um, you know, give some kind of, you know, stored card experience uh, to these people. Second, as we, as we move, um, move towards, you know, opening up more areas where two-factor authentication is not needed. Like some of you guys know, if it is like, you know, under 2000 rupees, you don't need to go to two-factor two authentication, right? Um, can we actually make, can we actually make smarter two-factor authentication? For instance, you know, you will only leverage two-factor authentication based on the risk profile of the customer, right? Versus not in all the cases, right? Um, also, I was briefly talking about the earlier stage where um, we were uh, we were talking about the Sache-based products, right? 
um, in case of sachet based product whether it is uh, you know the banking experience or a lending experience or even the payment gateway experience um, i think the way you underwrite some of these uh, users um, is fun is going to be fundamentally different from the way you um, underwrite a traditional uh, you know loan product uh, or a person who's getting onboarded for a payment gateway right uh, in my opinion i think you know the uh, not just the cash flow information but there are a whole lot of signals that are available in the market uh, which are quite helpful right um, there are a couple of more use cases like uh, you know we we in fact help our merchants to optimize their uh, their rtos in terms of cash on delivery uh, orders like um, as all of you guys know uh, most of the e-commerce um, companies goes to the challenge of uh, you know return to origin and especially the return to origin is quite high if it is a cash on delivery product right and uh, there is a the challenge of restocking that particular uh, product and then ensuring that you know the packaging and everything is up to the same standard as you know, the original product right so being able to upfront identify whether this customer is worthy enough to get a cod option or not right if you are able to identify patterns of that sort um, and then be able to enable those kind of capabilities to the uh, to the uh, to the merchant then the merchant can actually optimize on um, on their rtos um, as well um, again you know there are numerous patterns around um, fraud detection or uh, you know the security threat related stuff i think uh, the the challenge is still you know the quickness with which we can do i mean if if it is a, a typical hacking um, sort of an incident right uh, usually the hackers exploit a specific issue and they exploit it very quick and they come out of it right i mean they will not be leveraging that for a long duration of time so with the short window if you are able to identify and then do it um, i mean able to identify and then ensure these anomaly patterns are identified and then uh, you know caught up front i mean that's a great advantage to be in right i think the space is evolving quite a bit i think there is a lot of scope for it um as um, as we mentioned i think the whole uh, you know the this industry itself I mean, is kind of size uh, size 6 trillion dollars I, i didn't know about this number but having said that i won't be surprised with the number by the way yeah these are things which we are using I mean, you know, data at 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 raise a pay uh, per se. Yeah. Great, thanks, thanks, Raju, for adding the very important concept of metrics on top of some of those data capabilities you just mentioned. Let's turn now to Mayank from India Lens. Mayank, what are you looking at in terms of data frontiers, data futures, Mayank? Saurabh and Raju have already spoken about voice, and uh, uh, it, I think we're also quite big on voice. Right, we have a large call center ourselves, right, and there's a lot of information that we get. and so we're actually looking at it from both angles right i think one is obviously looking at it to improve sales and trying to build our own voice pods to the extent of actually going in and trying to build risk models based on the data that is coming from those conversations so there is a lot of analytics that is going on uh, especially in the voice area but we're also very focused on clickstream data and how the user interacts right and i think what uh, raju just mentioned on things like let's say card uh, customers dropping out of a card i think on similar front side we try to build response models specifically because we uh, offer multiple products to customers and so in being able to decide what's the right product to offer to the customer at the right time we do a lot of analytics using clickstream data and how he came, when he came to the platform how he behaved what were the things actions he took there's a bunch of that that we're doing so it all a large part of it is very unstructured data so the idea is always to sort of bring that unstructured data and be able to process it and obviously build our models to be able to then figure out you know this is the right product for the right customer at the right time i think that's the sort of stuff that we are looking at thanks man let's now turn to vijay from bharat pay vijay in your case what are some new data frontiers data regulations perhaps that you're looking at yeah sure madan so a lot has already been discussed and uh, that is all very 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 relevant to us also so we do all of that and we do more uh, so we've discussed uh, customer journey and clickstream data so that is something that we are very very deep into so we analyze a lot of click stream data a lot of user behavior uh, analytics around like how people are interacting uh, with our app what are the steps they are taking 
and like if they're facing some hurdles somewhere should should we prompt something to them should we raise an internal alert around something like if the customer is facing some hurdle is not able to proceed we raise an internal alert so we do a lot of click stream analysis we do a lot of customer journey analysis and optimizations to to like uh, make it easier and easier uh, for our, for our customers to use our app, app and uh, like uh, do what they want to do with the app uh, and this also helps us a lot in creating the right set of products like tweaking our products like uh be it like uh, creating more customized loan offerings or creating more customized uh deposit offerings or things like that uh, it helps us a lot in like uh optimizing our products uh, for our customers uh we we are also uh, a significant player in lending so uh, and that is where because we are uh, a significant player in transactions as well as in lending that that gives us a very unique uh view of uh, the two sides of the data which we use Uh, and we're actually very proud of like enabling a lot of our merchants in getting credit, which they otherwise do not get from the formal bank banking sector because they do not have a lot of uh, formal uh, transaction behavior, formal financial uh, information to enable them to get credit from uh, the larger bank. We enable a lot of such merchants to get credit from us, and the way we do that is like by observing their transaction behavior and and like na- analyzing and working out the risk profile and then enabling. Uh, are lending on top of that uh, this has this has assumed even greater significance in in the present covid times because uh, like otherwise uh, we would also and other players would also uh, like rely on the credit scores of these merchants but but in the current scenarios the, like the, the efficacy of credit scores has become like somewhat questionable uh, like uh, is, uh, the scores from the pre pandemic times are not really fully relevant to uh these times and therefore uh, transaction behavior is something which we uh which we take a lot of confidence in and and we like, do a lot of lending on top of that we're doing a lot of lending on top of uh, the transaction behavior of the merchants uh then we've also discussed security that is again uh, being a fintech it is extremely important to us and we do a lot of data analysis around uh detecting and preventing uh threats around uh like digital forms of uh vulnerabilities and otherwise uh, i i am personally a very very big fan of data and i i go to the extent of like even taking a very very data oriented approach for even things like employee engagement i mean i do regular employee and nps surveys within within my team to like to have very accurate and concrete data around like how engaged my people are and like how happy they are and, uh, like how much they feel uh, proud to be a part of our pay things like that Thanks, Vijay. We have just a few minutes left, so let me turn now to Subik. Subik, you have the last word. Subik, as part of MongoDB, you have a ringside view of all these startups in India. MongoDB is all over the world. So, what are you seeing in terms of some new data innovations, data trends? What should our audience be looking at? Sure. So, uh, you know, I think we a n- number of things that we touched about on how people are using behavioral analytics and ai and ml for fraud detection and anti fraud stuff we talked about personalization where we are seeing the use of data i even things like reducing cost of underwriting right so uh, and a lot of automation so with the bots and all of that happening there i think an interesting thing that i'm seeing uh, amongst our customers also is use of ai platform in the fintech space to actually create new lines of businesses right and uh, for example uh, there's a customer of ours in bangalore it's a, a startup which has built an ai platform but they're going after the students right so it's a complete it's a platform only for students which is a segment which not many people uh, Uh, you know the traditional means did not have many ways for lending out there so so the interesting part is the possibilities are a lot right but uh it's it's equally important to have and that's why i said it's very important to have that kind of a platform that gives you that ability to integrate and yet be secure right we talked about interoperability and that again what interoperability brings is a lot of data back into the system which again you can analyze and you can drive high level data sciences into it and and really come up with all these insights that not a uh, that allow you to a take care better care of your existing customers but also identify these white spaces 
in which uh, you know which can open up new revenue streams for organizations. So uh, we are very excited by what we are seeing out there. I think the f- fintech story overall is a very exciting play because it's really disrupting uh, the traditional players. I think the agility that fintech company has is obviously uh, a massive, massive advantage uh, that they have. But the other, just one other point I'd like to make is what we're also seeing is now this growing partnership between the traditional institutions and the fintech companies right so i think the traditional institutions are looking at okay how do we leverage the innovation and the speed and the agility and and for the fintech company there's access to this massive amount of data so i think even that partnerships can really sprout a lot of new businesses and new revenue streams for everyone so those are just some of the points i wanted to touch upon Thanks so much, Suvik. Thank you to Saurabh from Policy Bazaar. Thanks, Raju from Razorpay, Mayang from India Lens, and Vijay from Bharat Pay for all your valuable perspectives. Once again, on behalf of your story, I want to thank all of you for participating in TechSparks 2020. To just briefly summarize, I think three takeaways from me from this discussion are the three T's, trust, technology, and tenacity. Trust is all about going for the future and building a creative space of mind in uh, consumers and businesses. For this, you need a solid angle on technology and data, and you need tenacity to stay in this space for the long run with so many changes. Nobody knows when this pandemic will end and so on and so forth. Anyway, thank you all very much for a super round of discussions. Have a terrific evening. And thanks once again to all the audience members for joining us. Good luck. Bye. Have a great day.